We didn't say much about where the force came from. We talked about gravity and friction, but most of the things were just mechanical forces. And I mentioned at the time that they ultimately are due to electricity and magnetism. When you talk about a mechanical force pulling on something or pushing on something, what it really is is the repulsion between the electrons in your hand and the electrons in whatever object you're pulling or pushing. So that we didn't worry about exactly how that force arose. This semester, we're going to first spend the first half of the semester doing that, talking about electricity and magnetism. Now, for most purposes, that's the dominant force. Gravity, we notice simply because we happen to be near something very, very large over the Earth. The gravitational force between any two of us is negligibly small. In fact, it's smaller by a factor of about 40 powers of 10 than the electrical forces. Now, at the beginning of the semester, we're going to do electricity and magnetism. Once we get through that, we're going to go back and we're going to do thermodynamics and statistical mechanics so that we can finish up some of the stuff we did last semester. We did waves. You remember we calculated the speed of sound. I said when we come back and do thermodynamics, we'll be able to figure out exactly what the speed of sound is because we'll be able to calculate what the compressibility was. We're going to do that toward the end of the semester. At the very end of the semester, you'll have a choice. It's literally your choice between whether we do radiation from electricity and magnetism or we get an introduction to quantum mechanics. And how much time we'll have for that just depends on how things go during the semester. But either way, you get to decide whichever one you'd rather do. Okay, so let's start out and convince ourselves, first of all, that there is um, such a thing as an electric force. And that. Let me run experiment. I'm using a rubber rod and a rather unhealthy cap. So, <laughs> rub the cap and the rubber rod. What's wrong with this? If the only force we have is gravity, or mechanical forces, one pushing on the other, could this possibly be happening? No, because what I had there is a repulsion. And I got a repulsion without actually touching. silk on the glass, and I got an attraction. And now, if I took the glass, I got a repulsion. So I can't be having gravity. There's got to be some other force. It isn't mechanical. I didn't touch it. It is in friction. Surfaces are not in contact with each other. There's not gravity because it was repulsive or attractive, depending on which way I did it. So there's got to be something different. Now, remember when we talked about forces? We said two things distinguish one force from another. That was what caused the force to which we gave the name charges, and what carried the force from one object to the other. Now, charge was just a name for, for um, whatever it is that causes the force. You know, we feel better if we give it a name. We're not saying what it is, we just give it a name. Now, 
if the force was simply attractive, as it was in the case of gravity, what was the minimum number of kinds of charge you could have? You're getting one effect. You could do that with one charge. In this case, what's the minimum number of kinds of charge you could have? Could it be one? The minimum number you could have was two. Could it have been three? Sure. Or four, or five, or 20. Five is bad enough with two, so okay. let's stick with two. So, first thing we observed is that there must be at least two kinds of charges here. All right, well, it doesn't matter what we call them. We gotta give them a name. So we got two kinds of charge. Now the second thing of interest is going to be what how does the force depend on those charges? Well, we know from Newton's second law, Newton's third law, and discussion we had with gravity last semester, that it must be proportional to the product. It must be that because one on two must be equal and opposite to two on one. So the force is caused by the charge, so the force must be proportional to the charge. But it must be proportional both to charge on one and charge on two because of Newton's third law. And that means it's going to have to be a product. Making sense? All right. Now. Experimentally, we can measure how that force depends on the separation between the charges, and it turns out to be inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. So you have a charge T1, charge T2, separated by some distance r, and the force is going to be proportional to the product over the square of the distance. Now we saw last semester that there's nothing surprising about that when we talked about field lines, which you guys spent a lot of time on in our history. It became obvious that the force had to be proportional to one over r squared. Simply because the field line spread out covers an area that's got bigger and bigger edge r squared. Okay, so the force between the must be proportional to that, proportional to that, and let's put in some proportionality concept. And now just determine the units. So, first question then is, what units? Well, the unit is obvious. It is the cat stroke. And I think there's some absurd number of strokes on this thing. So that's going to be the unit. And so, what's going to happen? is that we're going to have a constant k, which is going to have dimension, if we do it in the MKS system, Newton <coughs> meters squared per cat stroke squared. Okay, so we'll do the appropriate measurements. We'll measure the force after a certain number of strokes, and we've got our dimensions and number for k. Well, the only problem is that as time goes on, our rather unhealthy cat gets more unhealthy, gets pretty worn down, so we have to get a new cat. Pete objects strenuously to this, but we go out and maybe let's get another cat that will be different. So maybe that isn't such a good choice. Maybe we shouldn't use the cat stroke. Um, now, what could we use? Suppose it turned out that there was a smallest charge, that you couldn't get charges of all sizes, that you got down to some smallest charge and could get no smaller. Then that would be the unit to use. Now, experimentally, it turns out that in any objects that you can get by themselves, the smallest charge is the charge that's found on an electron or the charge that's found on a proton. So the right unit to use would be the charge of an electron. Well, unfortunately, 
electrons were not discovered until the beginning of the 20th century, whereas the, all the laws of electricity and magnetism had been worked out by 1860. So obviously, we weren't going to use the charge on an electron because we didn't even know they existed. So instead, what was done was to choose a unit of charge by specifying the value of k. So what we're going to do is just assign a value to k. And then the charge will be that charge which produces a given force with k equal 9 times 10 to the 9. So we're going to arbitrarily assign k to have the value 9 times 10 to the 9. And when we do that, we're going to say that a charge that q is equal to 1, and the separation between the particles is 1 meter, then the force is 9 times 10 to the 9 newtons. And that gives the size of q. And for that charge, we measure in coulombs. In other words, a charge of one coulomb placed one meter from a charge of one coulomb will produce a force of nine times 10 to the nine newtons. So we've defined a charge by specifying a value for k. So this then has units, Newton, Coulomb squared, no, Newton meter squared, no, Coulomb squared. Meter squared, no, Coulomb squared. Now, if we had known about electrons, then we would be able to specify this charge in terms of the charge on an electron. In which case, one electron, the magnitude of the charge, is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. In other words, a coulomb is about 6 times 10 to the 18 electrons. Now, if we were doing atomic problems, worrying about the attraction between the electron and proton in an atom, then the natural size of charge is the charge of an electron. But if we're working about worrying about the, the um, amount of divided by the charge of this ball, then the limit that the charge goes to Remember, the reason for that was we wanted to measure the effect of what was there before I put my little charge there. When I put my little charge there, it could move the other charges around, and therefore I wouldn't be measuring what was there before I put my test charge there. So to avoid that problem, what I do is I make smaller and smaller test charges so that it doesn't disturb the situation that was there in advance that I'm trying to measure. Any sense to everybody? Now, when we did this with gravity, there was no problem. Because we could imagine the masses getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, arbitrarily small. But we can't do that with charge because there is a smallest charge, namely the charge on an electron. Now, that isn't going to make any difference if we're dealing with macroscopic objects, because they're <coughs> 6 times 10 to the 18th of them. But if we're dealing with an atom, there's one. And so this is a significant problem. The fact that experimentally, we couldn't do this. We couldn't actually make the charge vanishingly small. So we get around it by saying, OK, so I couldn't do it in, in practice, but I can do a thought experiment. What I can do is I can lock all the other charges in position. 
That ensures that moving this thing in didn't disturb them. And I can throw away the effect, the field that this charge itself produces. And so that's the way we're going to do this. Now this seems like just nitpicking, but as we'll find a little bit later, if you don't do this, you get the answers wrong by a factor of two. So this really is an important idea. So the electric field is the value of the force on a test charge at the point divided by that test charge if you lock everything else in position and you don't count the field produced by the charge itself. Making sense to everybody? Okay. So, so far it's exactly analogous to what we did for gravity. All right. So then, we set up a graphical way to represent vectors. And I know this is all the new We started out, yes. Sorry. Um, is that something we can do experimentally, or are we just thinking about this theoretically? Which? Locking things in place. Oh, that's something we cannot do experimentally. But we, so we imagine a thought experiment in which we have done it. Now, for a macroscopic situation, this is unimportant because you can make the test charge small enough it doesn't disturb it. But for atomic situations, you couldn't do that. In other words, if I bring up a one electron next to a big sheet of metal here, there's not going to do much to the metal. If I bring up one electron next to one electron, that's going to produce big effects. The question is, it's a theoretical, it's a thought experiment. Now this was our starting point for representing vectors. Just the direct of the line where the length of the line gave the magnitude of the vector and the direction of the line gave its direction. Now, when we did gravity, we decided to change that so that the vector was represented by a directed line that gave the direction of the field of the vector, but the length of the line had nothing to do with its magnitude. It gave only the direction. To get the magnitude, we had lines everywhere. And we counted the number of lines per unit area perpendicular to the direction. And that was the magnitude. So the magnitude is equal number of lines per area perpendicular to the line. In other words, it's this area Make it, you imagine the area, the little element of area, perpendicular to the direction of the lines. And then the number of lines per area is the magnitude. Now, do you remember all of that from last semester? Make sense to everybody? All right. Yeah. We imagine a situation in which you put a charge plus Q at some position in space. And now you ask what the lines, it's representing the vector representing the electric field, what those lines would look like. <coughs> well, due to the fact that the universe is isotropic, the laws of nature are the same. And direction as one of our starting assumptions. That means that the field lines must be running out uniformly in all directions. Otherwise, you'd be preferring one direction over another. So we're going to have field lines running out uniformly in all directions. It looks like a sea of energy. 
fall with lines running out uniformly in all directions. Okay. Now, let us draw ourselves a little imaginary sphere of radius r surrounding this thing. Now, since the field lines are running radially outward like this, they are everywhere perpendicular to the surface of that sphere or something else. And the answer is, it's linear up to a certain size of electric field. Now, the reason it ceases to be linear at that point is that we're going to find a little bit later that there is an energy associated with an electric field, basically some constant times the square of the electric field. Now, when that energy becomes large enough, it becomes enough that the E equals mc squared, that is the energy associated with the particle of mass m, when that energy becomes less than the energy of the electric field, the electric field energy can go into making a particle and a particle pair. In other words, you can create an electron and a positron when the electric field becomes big enough. And at that point, of course, superposition no longer works. Yes? So would it necessarily be an electron and positron? No. Any particle and a particle pair. And that would be based on the amount of energy? Precisely. And that means there's a certain maximum electric field beyond which you will not have superposition. In other words, you added two electric fields, you got none. Instead, what you had is two particles. Now, we're going to assume that we stay below that limit. So for us, we're going to have electricity meaning obeying superposition. In the case of gravity, what happens is that, remember when we were talking about general relativity, the amount of mass that you have, mass and energy, determines the geometry of space. And as you add more mass and energy, the space becomes curved. So the shortest distance between two points is no longer a straight line, it's a great circle or something. That meant that gravity did not obey superposition as soon as the masses involved got to be too big. Now because the gravitational constant is very small, the mass has to get very, very big before superposition fails. Well, same thing happens here. The electric field has to get quite big before superposition fails. And we're going to assume we stay under that. Okay. Now, given that, we then consider a this volume, we place a collection of charges, all sorts of charges on the inside, just as before we had all sorts of masses on the inside. All right. Now, each of those charges emits or needs field balance. Because of superposition, what this one does is not affected by anything else around it. It produces this number of field lines independent of anything else that's present. So, what must be the total number of field lines leaving that volume? 
it must be four or five K times the total charge inside the body. Like this. So, number of lines to do. Must be equal to four or five K times the charge inside, which is the sum of the positive charges minus the negative. All we need to do is find a way to calculate the number of lines needed in terms of the electric field. Well, the way we did that is we have to add up the lines leaving each little chunk of this surface. And so we blow up a little piece of the surface. Now, if it's a tiny piece, it's going to look like a plane. Any surface, if you look at it small enough, unless there's singularity on it, if you look at a small enough chunk of it, it's going to be a plane. The Earth looks flat. Okay? So, we have this little chunk. Okay? We define a vector area so that if the area of this little piece